Welcome to another edition of Tree Stock with your host, David Trees. My name is Robert Roblevsky, Business Development Manager here at Trees Financial Group. We'll be answering your questions through the Q&A and comments that is located on your Zoom function screen. We are excited to be here. It's been a little while since we last got together and David is here to discuss the current market. And we are starting to approach the first day of summer as of tomorrow, so we have a lot to cover. Now, DTC, please bring up today's poll. Have any of these four Ds disrupted your financial plans for retirement? Debt, divorce, disability, death of a spouse. Thank you. Now let's welcome David Treese, Investment Advisor Representative, who has been serving your community and beyond for 30 years. David? Well, it's great to be back. I guess it has, it does seem like a while. I um, hope everyone had a good Juneteenth holiday and uh, welcome to another Trees Talk. Um, and I think the last time we had a special guest and so um, that was um, Angie Bellinson on elder law planning. So this is the first one I've done on um, some of the economy uh, topics. And it's been an interesting time with the uh, the Fed, the debt ceiling, so many things going on. But to get to the poll question, because as you know, we're obviously you know, investment advisors and financial planners. So uh, to talk about some of these issues, obviously when we do our planning, we look closely at these things like um, debt. Um, is somebody is this our biggest priority to pay off debt? We're frequently asked about paying off a mortgage, and because. People have interest rates that may be so much lower than current interest rates. We you know, take that into account. Of course, it's also a question of if somebody's staying in the house or cash flow. Um, we look at any debt. If there's high interest debt, we typically always want to get that paid off, especially if somebody is coming into money, perhaps from selling a house. Um, and you know, there's other debt that we prioritize, like a, you know, IRS debt as well. So we always look at that to make sure that you've got lower expenses in retirement. Um, divorce is um, you know, definitely an issue, part of our planning there. Um, usually somebody who's come to us may already have gone through a divorce years ago and we're looking at uh, things like social security, divorced spouse benefits. And of course, if it happens that somebody is going through something like this, we you know, try to, you know, for our clients, we always try to, you know, protect their interests. That's our job as fiduciaries. So, um, you know, and that is an issue with a few people that we're working with, that they have gone through a divorce, it's all done. And then we're basically working with the assets for one of the divorced spouses. Um, the other um, issue here that one of the other Ds, the third D is disability. Disability, um, I'm also going to talk about long-term care here. Disability insurance generally applies for people who are um, working, they're still in their working years. And I always look at group benefits. And if you've got short-term, long-term disability, I wanna make sure if you have it available, I wanna make sure that you're getting it. If you are independent, um, a professional, a small business person, then you can um, get private disability and it is a form of health insurance. So it can be expensive. We can look into it for you. We are licensed to do this. We can shop it, explain it. It can be very expensive. Disability insurance per se has a lot of underwriting because there is the, of course, the medical and health underwriting that people are used to. Um, there's also the financial underwriting. You have to be eligible for the amount of coverage that you want to take out. So somebody who's you know, making, let's say, to use an extreme example, minimum wage, can't take out a multi-million dollar disability policy. It obviously it creates an incentive um, to be disabled. And then thirdly, there is the job duty underwriting, which can be complicated. Um, for example, if you're working in construction or demolition, that's considered risky. Um, if you're you know, doing an office job, that may be less risky, although still it depends on the, the nature of the job. For example, a lot of um, attorneys or high stress jobs, you know, that can still be a higher factor for disability. So that's during the working years. One of the other um, big considerations we have in financial planning is that at, once you're retired, it's in like a long-term care situation. Again, getting back to our special guest last time, Andy Bellinson, um, often somebody will become disabled, if you will, but they're unable to do what we call activities of daily living. 
and there are the ones that insurance may cover if you buy that insurance, that is the transferring toilet incontinence, feeding yourself, um, dressing yourself, those activities of daily living. And then there's something called instrumental activities of daily living, which may be you know, just oriented towards cleaning and cooking and uh, transportation. So there, you may need help with those. One bottom line point is nothing will destroy a lifetime of saving faster than those long-term care expenses, which can end up being like five to $15,000 a month. I mean, it depends on if you need full-time care and, and where you are. So we are uh, big believers in trying to plan for that. And of course, if, as, if you saw Andy from last time, if somebody is running out of money and they still need help, they may be able to get then um, Medicaid, which can cover you know, certain, um, you know, certainly a nursing home and a few other benefits too. So disability and long-term care. Um, and then the last of those Ds was death. And I, I make this joke, those of you who've heard me before, this is not a pleasant topic. Um, we have all this software. We, um, I typically don't put in the, um, the euphemism. This is the joke. It's like the ending retirement date, <laughs> sometimes called death. <laughs> Unless you're planning to go back to work, um, that's typically death, the ending retirement date. Um, obviously, we plan very much for this um, a couple of ways. One is we want to make sure that you don't outlive your assets. So that's where we're looking at um, you know, our retirement planning software where we project the income. We make sure that given all of our um, variables, our assumptions, rates of return, how much you've saved when you want to retire, inflation, that you're on track to not run out of money. For couples, it gets to be trickier. And um, if a pension should be lost, clearly one social security check will be lost. That's just the law. That if, um, you, unless you both spouses pass away at the same time, somebody will pass away first and then a social security check is lost. Of course, the, a legally married couple, one spouse can inherit the other, the other check, the higher check. So we do all sorts of planning there to make sure that there is um, a backup, either that we're gonna turn on another source of income or that we have um, life insurance or that the loss of that income for that one spouse uh, is going to be replaced somehow. That, because, and that can be a lot of money out of a household. So we do look at life insurance. The best, um, some of the best forms of long-term care insurance are based on, actually on using life insurance. Um, so that's something that we try to plan for there. So there, there's, I mean, a ton of stuff there. Planning for death also includes making sure that your wishes are carried out. You've got the legal documents, transferring assets to beneficiaries, which we do very frequently. In fact, I think we are about the best. I trust us more than, you know, even attorneys who are involved in this to, to get it right, to get inherited IRAs set up to make sure that the money gets transferred and often, I'm going to say we are, we will be working with beneficiaries as new clients. Often you would assume when somebody inherits money that that money is going to go to their existing advisor or will be used. And often um, we get a new client then because we have done, I think, an admirable job of making sure that the, our client, may, who may have been the one who passed away, is, is taken care of. Sometimes people actually come to us when somebody has passed away to uh, help with all of that. So we definitely have a lot of expertise on that. Um, and again, if you've got any questions on anything, we'll be getting them uh, to them towards the, um, the end. And I see we've got a few things coming in already. So we'll, um, feel free to um, ask some questions there and we'll, we'll get into them. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the markets briefly and these, again, are still super interesting times economically. Um, we've had a big run-up in the stock market, yet there's been a, an incredible amount of risk and tension, partly because of the debt ceiling um, issue. So um, this is from Hanlon Investment Management. Um, equity markets added to recent gains um, last week with a broad-based rally pushing the S&P 500 and NASDAQ to 14-month highs. For the NASDAQ, it was the eighth consecutive weekly gain, its longest streak since March of 2019. So that's pretty significant. The S&P 500 gained 2.6% um, during the week last week, 
the NASDAQ up 3.3%, the Dow again, the gained the least 1.2%. I, I, I pointed out several times, and this continues to be the case. Last year, we had the NASDAQ performed the worst down around 30%, then the S&P 500 second worst, the Dow performed the, the best of all three of them was down the least. This year, it's exactly the opposite. It is the, the NASDAQ that is up the most, followed by the um, S&P, and then the Dow is up the least. So I'll give you some uh, numbers there. And even I'm going to point out on the S&P 500, something that's really interesting. It's the gains are really being driven by some of the large tech stocks. It's not really broad based at all. If we can see that then through the, these other indexes, the Dow is just, again, just 30 stocks. So we're seeing these gains being relatively concentrated. Um, uh, getting to the Fed's interest rate hikes, again, this is again, kind of interesting. We keep thinking, here we are in June, and that um, we thought that towards the beginning of the year, we would see a, uh, an end to the interest rate hikes that inflation would be under control. Finally, we did get a pause. Um, but again, this is from Hanlon. The Federal Reserve Open Market Committee delivered a telegraphed pause, but tried to remain hawkish, uh, to maintain hawkish rhetoric, meaning that they're still talking about increasing interest rates the rest of this year. Um, this is regarding their policy statement and economic projections. The Fed now looks uh, at the inflation data to show further improvement before next month's July meeting, before deciding whether to resume hiking or to stay on pause. And the expectations show two additional rate hikes. And uh, Jerome Powell set, stated that nearly all the participants expect additional rate hikes in 2023, um, the, the Fed voters. So again, it's interesting. We, um, everything we've said is data dependent. Are we showing success in getting inflation finally under control? We've had new numbers that were somewhat positive. The CPI inflation index showed progress, at least on the headline reading which factors in food and energy prices, which are more volatile. So the headline, that CPI grew just a tenth of a percent in May, bringing the year over year pace down to 4%. So that's really good progress. Um, but the Fed is, looks at the, the less volatile core CPI, which excludes um, food and energy. That was up four tenths of a percent um, last month. And so that is a higher rate, 5.3%. Um, that's still an improvement um, from April, which was 5.5%. The, the Fed's target rate is 2%. So the, we're still a long way to go to get in, um, the inflation down closer to where the, the Fed wants it. And of course, this takes time. So we'll, we'll see if we, based on more inflation data, if we still need to continue to raise interest rates. Of course, the risk with all of this is that it can slow down the economy too much and actually cause a recession. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, also, um, the, uh, Jay Powell is going to be addressing Congress. And so we'll see his twice yearly report on monetary policy. And we'll see what um, you know, he says there. Um, there's some interesting, all of these markets that we're looking at, one of them is the housing market. U.S. housing start, starts surged in May. This is from Cetera Investments. Um, surge rising 21.7% to 1.63 million annualized. New housing constructions at a 13 month high. The housing market still dealing with low inventory of existing home, homes, which is resulting in increased demand for new homes. And this is another key uh, metric that the National Home Builders Association survey climbed five points to 55 in June its sixth straight monthly increase and marked the first time in 11 months that confidence surpassed the midpoint of 50 out of 100. Um, and we were expecting it to be unchanged. So to go up five points and to be on the positive side. So that's um, really important that now the home builders confidence is uh, not negative, nor is it even neutral. It is now turned positive. So again, that's you know, a good sign for the future. But I'm still going to talk about a little bit about the, the economic projections as we get into mid-year. And again, to talk about the lack of breadth in the market, by that I mean how concentrated the gains are. 
The NASDAQ is up just over 30%. This is um, as of the close Friday. The S&P just under 15%, but the Dow only um, up just uh, about three and a half percent. So that tells you something. We used to say um, a rising tide lifts all boats when talking about these indexes, that they might be, uh, perform somewhat similarly. But that's not been the case at all, neither last year nor so, uh, uh, nor so far this year. Um, getting back to Sintera Investments Management, mid-year outlook, quick overview. Um, in the second quarter, the S&P 500 index broke out of a bear market and entered a bull market, rising 20% off its low point in October. Now, keep in mind how low it went. This started January of last year, and the market was down virtually all of the year. And we had a little bit of a bump up and then hit a bottom in October. So we're starting from a really low point, and now it's coming back up. So, but here again is this point I'm making. Much of the strength in markets was driven by mega cap growth stocks, partially fueled by the enthusiasm around artificial intelligence. There are different indexes, even of the S&P 500, for example, there's an equal weighted one. And then there's um, the actual um, one that's just weighted towards the value of the, the companies. So that is not equally weighted. And the, the, these large cap co uh, companies are the ones that are really out producing. If the equally weighted S&P is not up nearly as much. So it, again, it's kind of interesting to see where the targeted growth has been. And so it's just a handful of stocks that make up the large weighting in the index and that accounted for most of the, the run up here. Now, um, there is still risk. That's one of the questions people are asking, are we out of the woods yet? And there are all sorts of measures that we still have that show that there is still risk. And of course, as I mentioned, we work with a lot of money managers who will go to cash, even 100%. That's not the most common thing, but the idea is they're going to try to control risk in a big downturn. And again, that's for people who are risk averse or people who are already in retirement. And they don't want to get a statement that shows that they're down 20 or 30%. They want somebody to get them out of the market at a certain point, like a stop loss. So um, one of the things we're looking at, a lot of forward-looking economic data is pointing to elevated recession risks. And many are calling it the most anticipated recession in history. Um, that's kind of um, tongue-in-cheek there. Um, I make that joke about Argentina, where you know my husband is from Argentina. We have a second home there. There's a joke that it's the country of the future and always will be. It's like um, this recession's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and it never comes. And uh, it's, you know, it's like the interest rate increases. Like, well, they're going to stop, and yet they don't stop. Or that inf uh, inflation was supposed to be transitory, and it was going to be, I mean, literally just temporary. And once we get the supply chains back and are functioning after the lockdowns from the COVID, things will get back to normal pretty fast. Well, clearly that has none of that has been the case. So um, one of the things that uh, signals a possible recession is uh, an inverted yield curve, which is what we have. Um, right now we're seeing, and, and it's been this way on and off to various extent throughout this unusual period where you get more um, better compensated for short-term rates than for long-term rates. And you know, often that signals, not always, that there will be a recession. And there's just, there's just too much uncertainty for the longer-term rates to pay as much as the shorter-term rates. So a lot of economic data is um, signaling that that may be um, the case. Um, economic data um, may signal that there's a recession, but there are other optimistic signs and um, like some areas where high rates have really hurt, like the housing economy seem to be rebounding, as I just mentioned, on the housing statistics. And this, there's one idea that we could have a rolling recession. And by that, we're talking about um, various segments of the economy going into a recession and then um, getting out of it and then another segment going into it. So there, it's kind of unusual that could be optimistic. But this is a, a, a question is, will there be a recession? Yeah, I read all sorts of wild articles that said, oh, the, we're already in a recession or the, re, uh, the recession. Uh, one of them I was reading this morning, the recession already um, started and has ended. 
like last year. A lot of this is very backward looking, the National Economic um, um, Bureau for the, the research. Um, they actually will look back and say the recession started at a certain point and ended at a certain point, but it's very backward looking. So um, the, we'll, we'll see about, you know, how nobody's predicting any, uh, like a severe recession, but the risk is still there. And of course, we don't know what that means necessarily for the stock market. Well, sometimes the stock market does not react at all the way uh, you would think. Sometimes we get very good economic news and the stock market goes down and it's because the market is thinking, well, we're going to get more interest rate increases. And some, so it's like good news is bad news. And sometimes it's the opposite. We get bad news and we say, oh, okay, that's, that means that the interest rate increases are working and uh, inflation is going to slow down, and that means the interest rate increases are going to stop. So um, that's uh, it, it. All just remains to be seen. So um, that's where we are right now, and it's it's just been an interesting time. There's reason to be more optimistic, I think, um, but there is still some risk out there. So again, I get back to we try to invest everybody according to their time frames, risk tolerance, um, their income needs, their growth objectives and we take all that into account. I think I've mentioned a few times I enjoyed certain people who were calling in during the debt ceiling saying, should we get out? Should we get out? And we were typically already for those people out. <laughs> it's like you don't have to worry about it. We've made that decision for you. Again, that's not for everyone, but we like the, uh, to be in that position where we're like one step ahead. So on that note, I'm going to um, turn it over to Harshita for any um, questions that we may have, and we'll also do our poll results too. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions here, David. The first one is, what is the difference between long and short-term disability? The, the short-term disability tends to be obviously something that's not going to last very long, less than a year. Um, so you, there's usually in those policies what's called an elimination period, and that is where you have to pay out of pocket for 30, 60, 90 days. And then your policy um, kicks in. That's a really important way to keep the cost of that down. So that's where we say have your emergency money if something goes wrong, that you have a sickness or an accident and you can't work. And so then you pay out of pocket the first 30, 60, or 90 days. Then you file for disability. And the, uh, the short-term disability will kick in for a year. Long-term disability then would kick in after that. And you can buy those policies separately. Generally, you get both of them. You can, uh, the easiest way to get it as payroll deduction, if you have it as a group benefit, the underwriting is a bit easier. And um, yeah, I've been through it with um, both in our family and with clients to, um, to do those claims. Um, so it's an important benefit. I tell younger people, you're far more likely to be disabled temporarily than to actually pass away prematurely. And I think that's a terrifying thing for most people who are younger and working. It's like, well, if you pass away, you're not here. If you are really unable to work and it could be you know, at, at some point where you're completely innocent, a car accident, a, um, something of, that you have ticking inside you that's, you know, you have an, an illness that just surfaces and you cannot work. And I tell these stories, I don't want to repeat myself because I do that all the time, but um, there's somebody we've been working with who had got breast cancer and she's had to go through all the chemotherapy. She's fine, but she said if she did not have that disability policy, she would have lost her home. So that's the difference. It's really the, how long the disability lasts. There are a few other variables there too. For example, people talk about social security disability. That's the strictest de definition where you have to be totally, completely disabled. That means unable to do anything. Most of the policies that people take out privately refer to their own occupation where they're not able to do the job that they are doing now, like being a doctor, being a lawyer. So then it will um, kick in. Social security is that you can't do any job. So there's a lot of um, things to look at there in those policies. Thank you. And the second one is, how do I know if my spouse and I have enough life insurance? Um, there is um, a way to do needs analysis, and this is still subjective. 
but um, the important thing is to look at what your goals are. What if somebody passes away prematurely? Um, you want to look at the, what that loss of income means to you. For example, it could be, I, I want to make sure that I get to keep the house. So you want to make sure you've got life insurance enough to pay off a mortgage. It could be that um, I, where I'm going to lose a social security check. I want to make sure I've got at least some years of that money. Um, it could be that you've got children that you want to put through college. So it's looking at all of those things and the value of the income that is uh, potentially lost if somebody passes away. And one of the things I say to uh, term insurance, which is for a particular term, could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It builds no cash value, but it's very cheap and you still have to qualify for it. But um, that's the biggest bang for your buck. So somebody who is younger with lots of responsibilities um, with kids and a mortgage, and you know they are probably better off with the cheapest term insurance, and then you can get a lot for it. And then if and it's a lifesaver, I absolutely have seen this time after time after time. If, if somebody does pass away, and that the surviving spouse, their financial life would have been ruined without that life insurance, and I mean ruined like you're never going to be financially secure. You're going to have to get a job. You're not going to be able to keep the house. You're gonna to have to sell it and downsize. You're not gonna to have to, um, you can't pay for your kid's education. They're gonna to have to pay for it themselves. On the other hand, you know, they've got, you know, for $50 a month, they've got a quarter of a million dollar policy and we claim that and we get it. And, you know, that keeps things going. So the idea is we can run calculations and you can figure out how much you need and what it costs. The goal of life insurance is not to make somebody wealthy. Um, and in later years, I feel like I don't want people necessarily to be spending a lot on life insurance. It's like whatever's left goes to their named spouse or their named beneficiaries. But it also depends on goals. It may be that you do want to leave a legacy. You do want to leave something to charity. You do want to leave something to your kids. So that's a very personal goal um, and that, that we look at. And we can, have, in our income planning, we can say, I want to make sure when I pass away, I have this much left to go to beneficiaries. And again, the best way to do that is um, some sort of a permanent life insurance. And that's also something that um, we can set up for somebody. And uh, are there any good financial tips for a person going through a divorce? You know, one of my golden rules is always know what you have and how it works. And in this case, that would be also true for your spouse. That um, obviously these situations can get nasty. You want to try to avoid that, but you can have people try to hide assets. Um, so know what you have, know what is your debt. There's so much here, for example, I, I tell this story, I called into a credit card company, a bank, and um, this wasn't just a divorce situation, it was a death situation, but the, the widow was paying on a, uh, her husband's credit card, and she thought she owed this debt, and it turns out she was just an authorized user. This was not her debt. She did not have to pay. We got it written off, and you know that's the same thing there. Know what is in your name, what is in your um, spouse's name. Um, and we want you to try to get agreements, go through mediation. One of the things you have to do is that fiduciary rule. You have to do what is in your own best interest and stand up for yourself and your you know, financial future. Um, the, one, the best bits of advice is to get good advice, build your team from an attorney, from a financial planner, and make sure that you stand up for yourself. And if you are you know, somebody who's, you know, a wife who's put a husband through college and then you get divorced or um, you've got, I see this not infrequently, you know, a, a couple that's been together 20 or 30 years and then the, the husband in this example takes on a much younger wife and then the older, um, the, the divorcing wife is left alone and is like, you have a right to 
you know, do a, an agreement to be taken care of. So that's the advice there is to make sure that you get, build a team, get good advice, stand up for yourself, and protect yourself, protect yourself most definitely. And the last one is of, I guess, follow through on your market commentary. Did you say that S&P and 500 and NASDAQ are at record highs due to just a handful of primarily AI stocks that are way up? Tech stocks, not specifically AI stocks. But yes, the, um, it is definitely concentrated in um, some of the, um, the typical big movers. So it is not um, a broad-based uh, economic based um, growth. Um, and again, I want people to have perspective here because last year it was the opposite. Those were the companies that cratered. They went way down. And we've seen this in the past. Sometimes it's the dividend stocks that really underperform. And these may be mainstream companies. I can't name publicly traded companies, but um, they're giving a great dividend, but then the underlying stock value is pretty stagnant. And you know, sometimes those will do better. Um, other times they underperform and as opposed to growth stocks. So we have these terms, the growth and the value. So growth stocks typically tend to be these tech stocks that are doing um, really well. They're into new territory. There's high demand. They may not pay any dividends. Um, like a lot of the the artificial intelligence, the newer um, companies in this, many of them are not publicly traded at all. So we have to wait until they're publicly traded. Um, and then you've got value stocks, ones that are beaten down. You know, to think about those, like during the pandemic, you had a lot of um, consumer um, stocks that were, you know, people were in a lockdown, so they weren't doing travel entertainment. Um, so those stocks really got beaten down. And so you, then you, you think of them as value stocks that you buy them on sale as opposed to growth stocks, that, you know, buy and hold until they come back. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's the answer there. Thank you, David. And back to you for your closing remarks and the quote. Um, there was an interesting quote um, here for our closing remarks. Um, I'm also just going to say as I wrap it up here that Feel free to reach out to us for um, any questions on anything if you need help, um, and we'll definitely um, get back to you on it. Retirement is the only time in your life when uh, time no longer equals money. Well, that refers to that you're no longer working. Um, of course, the the big thing, the difference there is <laughs> the um, while you're not working to make money, it's like there's no paycheck coming in either, and that's scary for people. And of course, part of our job is to replace that paycheck with the turning on the other assets, whether it's um, starting Social Security or turning the like a 401k or a 403b into monthly income. Um, so that's what we do there. So um, kind of an interesting quote. So um, we plan for that for you. So it's not as intimidating. That's it. Thanks for joining us uh, for Therese Talk. And